Well, welcome to another episode of Covered with the Utah FOP. I am your host, Brett Rawson. We got a lot of new titles in here today. Yeah, we do. I don't know how I'm going to keep track of all of them. I'm Brett's not a lawyer anymore. <laughs> from, <laughs> from your mouth to the Almighty, if only. No, we've got uh, we got a lot going on. A lot of lot of recent changes. Uh, got some guests we're going to introduce here in a second. But uh, Brent is here, uh, usual suspect. But you've got a new title. I do. What's your title, Brent? Uh, I think we settled on Commandant. <laughs> That'll work. A commandant works, and in this, <sighs> as everybody knows, in this venue, Commandant may stick. So be careful what you ask for. Executive director. Executive director of this state lodge. Utah FOP. Congratulations. Thanks. Now, that suggests that something changed. Something did change. Yeah. Tell us, we, about, uh, uh, tell us about this gentleman here to my right. So as uh, everybody that's been following on social media and, and everything, I decided this last conference not to run again. And, you know, for a, a, a couple of reasons, and the, the biggest one of which was that Kevin was ready. You know, we've been, uh, um, and, and we'll be getting into a lot of what's going on, um, over the next few episodes, but. And you're speaking um, of, uh, this gentleman right here with the beautiful locks. The beautiful Kevin locks. Murray, which. They're tamed right now. So that's tamed. Good. Usually they're in pigtails. <laughs> right. And so, um, you know. I was, I was uh, really hoping. Whatever. I was hoping he was wearing pigtails. Say the word. <laughs> in Florida, I mean, it's like a 30 second do. I mean, right. you remember when he did it? Oh, I, Florida? how could I forget? I, yeah. I mean, you you took this a lot of photos longer, of them. It's going to be braided. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So Kevin uh, Kevin Murray ran for and won. Um, well, I guess actually you didn't uh, you didn't. There wasn't an election after. There wasn't well. an election. So you are our new state FOP lodge president. Congratulations. Thank you. Still waiting for it to set in. I know. And you it know, just I'm happened. Just... I mean, it, by the time this plays, uh, again, in the magic of podcast land, um, it will have been months. But uh, now it's just been, in, what, a few weeks? How, how long well, has it been? Well, so the conference was the beginning of November. Yeah. And then we did, a, we did an interesting thing, and it had, never, it had never been an issue before. As we typically do after uh, after the elections, we have somebody swear in the the new board, and yeah. in the Constitution and bylaws, it says that the new office takes effect January one following the election. Yeah. Well, this year uh, we had uh, we had four national board members uh, come in for the conference, and uh, we had the new board sworn in by the chair of trustees, Rob Pride out of Colorado, and I was at dinner that night with uh with rob and and something came up and i i made a comment about yeah you know we've got roughly two months to transition and he was like what do you mean and i'm like well yeah we had this but you know then the constitution bylaws and he's like bro i think you guys are the only ones in the country that do that i'm like so so what, me, what so do you mean let me back up so the way that that it's it's worked historically here in utah is that there's a, an election. In this case, it was an uncontested election. Uh, Kevin uh, wins by acclamation. Then because the board, this the national board was in town, we wanted the honor of having them swear in. Right. So they do that. So they do that. And uh, in, in years past, if, if that hadn't happened, we would have had this like lame duck waiting period of a yeah. couple months before I mean, it's Thanksgiving January. and yeah. Christmas coming up and it's never an issue. And I was talking to... Uh, uh, national national president Pat Yost, mm -hmm. and uh, and we were talking about a variety of things, and and at the end of the conversation, he's like, "So, so what? What's going on with the swearing in?" And I'm like, "Well, you know," and and yeah. we kind of re uh, re talk about what what he said, and he goes, "Yeah, you guys are the only ones in the country." That he goes, "That happens with with local lodges." Mm -hmm. He goes, "But state and national, it's always." As soon as you're sworn in, when you're sworn effective. in, that's a that's yeah. effective. And I'm like, oh crap. And he yeah. goes, what do we do? And he goes, well, you, he goes, you can write it out, and you know maybe there's not an issue or or anything like that. And I said, well, what would you do if this was you? And he said, I would, I would probably make a motion to to vacate the old board and install the the new board prior just, to the first of the year. Prior to the first of the year, but at least have a vote there in front of the uh, yeah. the board and the trustees and. 
And that's yep. what you guys accomplished in the December meeting. Yep. December 8th, um, we, we had a motion to vacate. It was unanimously supported, which was weird. Ryan almost got up and walked out of the room as a show of his vote. Um, and it, and it went into effect and, and which was fine because we, since the election would, would been operating a lot that way. Sure. You know, um, so what that means is Kevin, you've been the president for like four days. Well, basically what we did is we squo- <laughs> we squoze Brent for one more, one more month that, yeah. uh, <laughs> Good. that we didn't need to. Squeeze so him I all was, you want. I was yeah. able yeah. to sit back it. for a little while and just let him do his thing. Good. It good. was good. Well, so we've got a new board, and uh, and so congratulations uh, to everybody, Brent. Thank you so much for your service. I know that that will continue in your capacity as executive director, and we're we're pleased uh, that you will continue with us. And so, um, yeah, big big changes, and uh, very excited to see uh, what this new board has in store, uh, Kevin. I know you and I have spoken about uh, some of your ideas. I can't I can't wait to see those materialize in coming months and uh and i'll let you uh make you know proper announcements about those things uh, when the time is right perfect now i want to uh shift gears just a little bit to recognize our guests in the room we've got some friends uh that have uh returned to us um we have mary kent from uvu hello mary it's so nice to see your smiling face over there and uh so glad that you've returned when you were here before as i recall you had uh, your your friends from Children's International Rescue Foundation. Yes, I correct. Get that right? Mm-hmm. And uh, they were kind enough to spend some time talking to us about all their efforts throughout the globe to uh, really fight uh, in a very direct way human trafficking, especially as it relates to children mm-hmm. and, and the amazing cause that that is. So uh, welcome back. Good uh, to be here. Yeah, great to, to have you here. And we also have uh, our friend from Provo, Tyler Clancy. From District 60, I got that right. I was going to call him Tom, but I'm not sure he brought a, a novel. I'm not even sure that that uh, everybody in the room can read, so that's good. That's why they make Audible for me. <laughs> <laughs> with, I pictures, don't hide. with pictures, I can usually <laughs> Very good. figure it out. Well, Tyler, thanks for coming and being here with us. I know that, uh, and, and we will welcome you to pipe up as much as you can and, and want to in this first uh, episode we're going to do two today but uh, the second episode is going to be uh, the Tyler Clancy show we're actually oh. renaming the show uh for that purpose so okay. prepare yourself with autographs and yeah right I I brought my copy of the hunt for red October and... very good I can't <laughs> wait <laughs> to talk to you about the hunt for red October Mary what are you up to these days Oh, I'm busy with the uh, finals. Uh, I work at uh, Utah Valley University as a professor, as well as the director of the program I'm here to talk about today. I knew there was a reason why I <laughs> right? felt nervous in here. Right. And well, it... I, I would like to point out that you were here hours early. You were so excited <laughs> to hear true. from me today. <laughs> it's true. I have. Been, this is my second time to the building. I was two hours early the first time, but you can never be too prepared. Right, professor? Correct. Yeah. Very, very good. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> I'm uh, right now I'm working on uh, just getting students grades in finals in and uh, prepping my students for their law enforcement internships in the spring semester. Wow. Very, very exciting. Yeah. Well, that's that's good news. But I know that's not the only reason why you're here today. You're here to talk about something special. And uh, I am. Let's hear about it. All right. So I'm the director of the Open Source Intelligence Center. Now, this center is a part of Utah Valley University. My program is under the National Security Studies Department. And what I do is essentially train students to become open source intelligence analysts. That's my background. So I worked for the uh, Utah Statewide Information and Analysis Center for about five years or so. And I continue to be an intelligence analyst today. But I'm preparing these students to graduate from programs such as National Security Studies, Forensics, Information Technology, Criminal Justice, to go out in the world and be able to use these analytic skills specific to openly available information. So when I say open source, I'm talking about anything openly available to anyone on the internet. That is, that's fascinating. I mean, you know, and, and without knowing too much about it, a lot of it sounds a little bit kind of spies like us. I mean, you've got uh, the yeah. application of of, um, you know, the information that you're analyzing, I, I, I'm assuming there's some operational component to to that. You're sharing this information or, or preparing students to share that information with their employer so that they can go out into the world and hopefully do good things. Correct. So um, 
it being open source information, we do train our students on how to ethically and morally search for information online to assist in active criminal investigations. So each student that comes into the program, they have to apply. They go through an application process, an interview. It isn't just you sign up and you're in. Once these students come into the program, they spend one semester in the classroom learning all the, the techniques that I can teach them to search for information online. And during that first semester, they conduct five hours a week of internship work at local law enforcement agencies, as well as working with federal agencies and some national agencies like the uh, White Collar Crime Center. The second semester, their class is done, but they up their internship hours and they're just strictly intel analysts for local agencies. Oh, that's fantastic. Wow. Now, I know how to do the Google. All right. I just learned that the other day, how to get information on the, uh, the interwebs, as they call them. Um, but, you know, honestly, I would assume there are additional tools that you guys use. In the law business, we have Westlaw, we have LexisNexis, we have mm -hmm. specialized tools that we use uh, to to gather information for the work that we do. Right. I, I would assume you have something similar. We do. We use a mix of just clever searching using the Googles, as you put it. <laughs> um, so it's part just clever searching, knowing the search terms that that you need to use, but it is also using tools that open source hobbyists create using uh, computer coding or using a collection of, of websites that all are searching for the same information, but give different pieces of information within each website. And so we're trying to collect everything we can, all the websites that we have, we actually have created a platform where you can access all of them. And that's something we provide to law enforcement so that they have one stop shop to go search for information online. So it's it's kind of a combination of the two. And and so talk to me about your ideal uh, client, if you will. I'm assuming that you, I know you're preparing students, but do you also uh, do you provide these services for directly for law enforcement? Yes, absolutely. So um, in the this is a, a fairly new program. So we've been running for two years now. In those two years, we have provided open source investigative training to over. Oh, gosh, it's probably between 20 and 30 agencies within the state. Um, we're partnered with several federal agencies as well, um, just sharing information, doing research for those agencies. And uh, when we send students to each one of the, uh, each one of these lo local law enforcement agencies, they also provide the training and the tools, the same stuff they get in the classroom. They pass on to law enforcement to give them the same uh, resources. We my program, essentially, I believe that every agency should have the same training, no matter the size of the agency, no matter the funding the agency has. Um, it could be, you know, a, a tiny agency out in Tooele to Salt Lake City PD. Everybody deserves the wow. same training as everybody else. That's fantastic. Now, I've been uh, fascinated uh, with the advent of, of some of this artificial intelligence mm -hmm. uh, information that's been shared um, you know, in, in recent articles going back at least a year now, uh, jumped on the chat GPT as soon as it came out, found it just fascinating, especially in the use of, um, you know, putting websites together and just, you know, things like that. But the Bar Association, not just Utah's Bar Association, but a number of them uh, throughout the country are starting to do training for lawyers on the ethical utilization of AI mm -hmm. in their practices. Right. And uh, there's a lot there. I mean, there's a lot to learn. Um, it's it's materializing extremely quickly. And um, a few lawyers around the country have gotten caught, you know, pushing uh, uh, chat GPT uh, sourced information as legitimate research. And right. they found that, that the AI, you know, made up some citations and you know, made, awesome. made the laws up. <laughs> and so gotten a little bit of trouble there, but how, how, uh, well, first is mm. artificial intelligence utilized in your uh, field? And, and, and if so, how do you, how do you protect against some of the scarier things that we hear from people like Elon Musk and others who have deep concerns over the use of this emerging technology? There are some serious concerns about AI and um, we do a section of our class on AI, the ethics, the problems we have with it. Really, AI can be developed into an amazing tool. I mean, as time goes by, the technology is going to get much better. And it's one of those things that in the right hands with 
um, the right motivations, it can be a great tool. And then the opposite, wrong hands, bad motivations, bad tool. With AI, it's more of a supportive program. I don't rely on it at all. I don't train my students to rely on it. And any information they obtain from like chat GPT, they are required to get the references that it provides them and actually go to those references to ensure that information is accurate. So with any criminal investigation, you still have to verify the evidence you're obtaining online. It's the same thing with AI. You have to verify that information. But AI is very good at providing information when you use specific terms. So as an open source intelligence analyst, you can ask ChatGPT to act as an intelligence analyst and then have it provide you information. And it learns and alters its results based off of your request for the expertise as an intelligence analyst. So you really have to know how to use it. If you don't, you're not going to get the results you want and it's going to be misleading. So there's still an element of, of garbage in, garbage out. You, you're Absolutely. Using it, use it like a calculator. You still have to have the big human brains behind uh, the scene to ensure that, that things don't go out of hand. Correct. Yes. And AI isn't just about uh, getting written information back. There's AI that creates images. There's AI that um, can alter video. I mean, there's there's lots of different applications of AI. So yeah. it really depends on what version you're using. Yeah. You know what I uh, what I've learned is that I am way underutilizing an app that I downloaded. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, it's like Uber Eats is an amazing app. You really <laughs> should not go out of your way anymore. <laughs> that's that's not the one. No, I, I mean, can like, tell by uh, the look on your face, you had by like using Chat GBT for, oh, okay. hey, uh, draft me an email about this, and then going back through and okay, I'll change that oh, word yeah. and change that word. I'm like, man, that's pretty handy. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. I, I did an entire website. I mean, every page of the website with Chat GPT and. It, I won't tell you which website because it, I just want to take total responsibility because it came out so good. But just the amount of time that it saved me putting that content What'd together. What you do? Just say, make me a website. Well, on and this? that's that's the thing. And and I know we're getting a little bit off topic. And I, I promise we'll come back uh, uh, full circle to Mary. I want to, but you know these these technologies are just incredible, and they have the ability to. Uh, really, you know, search and optimize, leverage the information that's contained in in every resource available on the internet, and scour that instantly to produce, um, you know, content in, in context, um, depending on what it is that that you know you're interested in writing about. And so, it really does require that the user have at least a basis and understanding of the subject matter because it, the more you feed into it, the better off you're going to be on the output. So um, like a calculator, I mean, you can hand me uh, a calculator that's capable of, you know, uh, astrophysics, you know. Um, Is that uh, using the, the function key? It, yeah, listen, you can <laughs> hand me the... that. Uh, let me clarify. <laughs> you can hand me that calculator. And it, for me, it yeah. would make a good doorstop. <laughs> because I don't know anything about astrophysics, I wouldn't be able to compute anything using that tool. But in the right hands, these uh, these AI um, uh, capabilities are are just uh, it's actually scary, you know. As I as I think more and more about uh, that, but that could be a topic for a whole other day. Mary, what what is your objective with your program? Um, where where do you see this program evolving over the next say two years? The objectives are um, to have these students graduate with experience. A lot of these jobs are asking for applicants with prior experience, but who gives that to them? So we want them to get this experience before they go out into the, the job field. And my last class, I mean, they're already getting jobs with FBI, mm -hmm. DOJ, and a bunch of different agencies because they have this prior experience. So that's a big one. The other one is to provide lessons on ethics and morals when we're doing this. There's a lot yeah. of focus on law enforcement and how they're using social media and in investigations. And I want to show that we are cognizant of that. We we are trying to provide those those boundaries and 
in law. There's not um, really any set laws right now how we use, say, emoji as evidence in the courtroom. Yeah. Um, it's this aspect of, of social media linguistics. That's another thing we're studying. How can images and memes and uh, emoji be used as criminal evidence? Can it be used as criminal evidence? So we are doing research that's going to advance our knowledge of all this social media information out there. And then lastly, to uh, provide law enforcement with with that same training, a resource that most of the time they just can't afford. Um, sure. And in the next two years, I hope to see the program grow. We really want to develop it. Right now, I, I can handle up to 20 students. Right. I am my only employee. Yeah. So we, uh, I would love to see the the program grow to to more students the ability to travel to more law enforcement agencies and provide them training because we offer that for free. That's no charge for law enforcement agencies in the state of Utah to get that training from us. Well, Mary, I'm told that uh, a few of our listeners have an interest in law enforcement. That's what that's what I hear. I hear that some of them might be maybe police officers okay, and okay. their family members. And so what would you say? I realize you have uh, room for just 20 students now, but what would you say to that aspiring uh, a police officer that's maybe reaching that point in their career where they're either going to separate early or they're hitting their 20 or 25 year mark, mm -hmm. want to go back to school and they find this stuff fascinating. What would you say to that person about the prospect of applying to your program? Do it. I have a, a student right now that is a retired law enforcement officer moving into the intelligence analyst field. And he applied for my program. He's actually been a leader within my class, very knowledgeable, um, I welcome those students because they already have this amazing foundation and they can share that experience with the other students. The other students are in their second year, third year of college, but you get someone who's a seasoned officer that adds so much to the program. That's fantastic. And I'll say this, uh, from an investigative standpoint, I have never had such good cases as what I have when I have an Intel analyst working it. It has been night and day difference. Um, they're much better investigators than what I am. Much, much better. So if you're thinking about utilizing this program or or uh, utilizing the knowledge that comes from the classes, um, just from my standpoint, as a criminal investigator, I have never had better cases than when an intel analyst is there. Is there for your interviews, the certain policies of, of uh, the DEA where I have to um, have their intel analysts come through and, and they sit on um, interviews with us. Holy crap. It's, they're way smarter than us, <laughs> way smarter than us, <laughs> or at least me. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. You know, I already made a, a, a reference to a, an old movie mentioning spies like us. I know that, uh, some of you remember that another old movie was the graduate. And I remember a scene where, uh, you know, the students back from college his first, I think it was his first year. And there, there somebody standing there in the hallway saying, you know, it's about plastics. You want to get into the plastics business, you know? And, and when I think about here, we are in 2023, if I was talking to a youngster, you know, I, and, and this has been for most of my adult life, the more that you can understand and uh, leverage the tool of technology and, and the emerging tools as they, um, you know, they change every year. I mean, let's face it. I mean, chat GPT wasn't even a word a couple of years ago. I can't imagine the tools that you have at your disposal, at your disposal in the intelligence field. And, you know, and you're working really giving these students, um, you know, a broad overview, uh, but it isn't probably until they get into their respective careers and get into these um, super top secret agencies where they get the, you know, fancy stuff. I mean, who knows what they're going to be exposed to right. in terms of technology, but the more you can prepare yourself, uh, for that, um, I think the better. So, so what kind of background, you know, if I was talking to a younger person, let's say there's somebody, I don't know, in their early twenties getting back from a mission or something. And mm -hmm. they're like, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up, dad. I'm, you know, you can might, you might imagine that this might be a very personal question that I'm asking you. <laughs> you know, if I've got a kid that's just listless, he has no idea what he's going to do. Now, what, what would you say to that young person? Uh, you know, do they, do they need to have a math background? Do they need to have a, an English background, like what literature, what, what is the thing that they should be focusing on as they get ready to make these big career decisions uh, that that inform what type of college program that they should get into? Know how to write. Yeah. I meet so many university students that just cannot write. And 
they, you know, these students may think that it's not necessary for an Intel analyst because you're looking up stuff online, you're collecting data. Writing is huge, huge. And so anyone who's interested in this program, you will have a far better chance of getting in if you can write. So focus on getting your your English courses completed. You know, get at least two, uh, not two semesters, two years of college mm -hmm. under your belt before you jump into something like this. Okay. And so even for our older um, uh, clients at the firm, you know, people that are at the end of their law enforcement career, mm -hmm. would you suggest if they have no college at all, that they at least get some of that GE out of the way and then uh, talk to you at that point? Or would you be interested in hearing from them early? I'd be interested in hearing from them early because they have experience that kind of trumps those classes. I right. mean, honestly, I'm a professor and I, I think it's great to get a college education, but experience speaks volumes. So I would say, you know, um, look at your writing skills, you know, maybe take some some writing classes, some English courses, but you don't necessarily have to have that college background. Brent, there's hope for you, brother. There is. <laughs> and Mary, I, I like what I like what you're saying that that really the tool is only as good as the officer or the person using it. And I think more and more as technology advances, you see people saying the tool is the answer. You know, this mm -hmm. new non-lethal weapon is the answer. But really, um, I think you, you hit on that fundamental point where it is the person behind the behind the tool. It really is. Yeah. What do you think, Brent? I, I know where to find you an application. Well, <laughs> so English has always been a, a strong point for me. Math. Yeah. Not. Not even not so much, like not at all. Sure. I didn't hear any um, math requirement. No, this, this was, does not need a math yeah. requirement. You do yeah. not have to write I, computer code. I think I would prefer the honorary route. <laughs> um, still, I called mean, the stole. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't need to be an honorary doctorate. I don't need anybody calling <laughs> right. me doctor. Right. But not yet. Not yet. One anyway. step at a time. Doctor, yeah. executive I've, director. Yeah. I've Commandant. Got, yeah. I've got Ian director. working on that for me from <laughs> University of South Carolina. Very good. You know, but uh, I think technology is fascinating. I I like staying up on stuff, but every time I think I'm staying up on it, I I realize how far mm -hmm. behind I am. I mean, I remember I remember taking a a course called PowerPoint for Law Enforcement. This has been oh man, twelve, fourteen years ago, and the instructor in the class. Uh, and we were talking about how, you know, to build PowerPoint presentations and all the cool things that PowerPoint will let you do and splash sheets and all this stuff. And at the time, the guy doing the instructing was talking about this concept about where in a few years, you're not even going to have to purchase DVDs. Everything's going to be available to you in this thing they're calling the cloud. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't know what you smoked just before you came in here, but I got like 120 DVDs and I'm going to be pissed if all of a sudden I don't need them anymore. <laughs> and now I look at it and I'm like, I don't even know if we even have DVDs anywhere. Well, we might in the trailer. I I don't know. I haven't seen them for a while. But I think one of the things to keep us in, in check is a uh, in 1899, there was a guy that ran the U.S. Patent Office named Charles Duell. And in 1899... Charles Dole made the statement that everything that can be invented has been. And then. I mean, he was today. close. I mean, he was. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah. And so it's it's part of that staying away from absolutes about, you know, the, that this is the the best that, that we can ever be. I mean, I just some of the stuff that we're talking about here when I was working. I mean, I and I, I wasn't a I wasn't a great open source guy. I mean. When at that time, I mean, we were playing around a lot on, you know, utilizing Facebook and and things like that. And and at the time, it was somewhat effective, but it's it's night and day from yeah. You it's know, changing from just fast. Five, I don't six know how years anybody ago. keeps track of it all. It's uh, well, I think it's people like Mary. Absolutely, that, I do my so. best. Yeah, well, that's great. No, I, it, it's fascinating. We appreciate uh, what you're doing, and um, just I, I mean. I was a little bit younger. I mean, I might take a shot at it. I, I really, I get excited about new stuff like this. And, you know, I- I'm so excited he has to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. That's the problem. I just don't have the energy I once had, you know, for uh, college. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I'm not, I don't know what my <laughs> wife would say if I said I was going back to school. Uh, she'd say, well, I don't want to say what she would say. <laughs> this, is a P, this is a PG show. Yeah. Most um, of the time. Most of the time. Yeah. We've tried to clean it up ever since- uh, 
you brought church people here. So, well, when we send Ian to South Carolina, that helped a little. It, uh, <laughs> my mom can listen to him again. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I guess I'll save the really, really hard questions uh, for Representative Clancy later. You know, I was going to hit him with a bunch of uh, a bunch of questions about uh, legislative issues as it relates to you know protecting the uh, the innocent uh, uh, people out there that you know this this great big technology in the sky that nobody can wrap their arms around or understand. And, you know, it's going to come down and take all of our, all of our civil, uh, civil liberties away. And Tyler, when um, he does that, I want you to, I want you to lean over. I want you to cover your mic, lean over and then come back and say, I have no recollection of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> boom. Flash of light. Just, yeah. Boom. <laughs> yeah. No, I, you know, and we touched on a little bit. I mean, laws, um, laws will change and laws will be developed as, uh, there is need, you know. We've we've seen just in the past decade or so the uh, the way that the government continues to struggle with things like crypto, and um, you know the the regulatory issues and uh, inefficiencies because the law is based on a time and an understanding of things that did not ever anticipate things as complex as the blockchain, and um, and so it's it's fascinating from a legal perspective. What has had to uh, uh, come into play to first conceptualize these things because you got to train lawyers on you know what the problems are, um, you know, and then and then the lawyers will opine about well what are the societal implications of this in consultation with social scientists and people from the the respective fields, and then eventually these things have to be evaluated by the courts, and and that's a process, and unfortunately it's a process that's much slower than the emerging technologies. So it's, it's fascinating where things are, uh, are ending up and, and, uh, I'm anxious to see where it all goes from here, but listen, we could talk about this, uh, for hours and hours. It's, uh, it's great stuff. I'm thrilled to hear that there is uh, a direct application to law enforcement and that you're training good people, um, to be prepared for their participation in those fields. Absolutely. And, and we need uh, we need those people. And we need folks like you uh, uh, searching for them. So if you're within the sound of my voice and you're uh, interested in a career change, maybe you're coming to the end of your uh, illustrious 20 or 25 years of law enforcement, or you're getting out a little early and you want to go back and learn something, we're always talking about how do we best make uh, that uh, seamless transition to the next phase of our lives and careers when we exit uh, law enforcement. And this is this is a soft landing because there's still such a direct law enforcement application to the things that uh, Mary and, and her organization are um, working in. And so tell us again the name of your program and then we'll wrap it up. It is the Open Source Intelligence Center and you can come and get a certificate in just that or you can come and get a full degree. Fantastic. And what is the best way to get more information about the program? Send an email to osic at uvu.edu. All right. That sounds great. And I think we'll leave it right there. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, stay safe. We care about you. We hear you. We're, we know that you're doing important things and we're glad that you're there. Thank you. Thank you.